slightly more I would look from the perspective as to what, what is coaching and what's an effective coaching. So Jonathan, over to you. Thanks, Adrian. Good morning, everyone. And, um, well, as Adrian said, I'm a, I'm a keen kayaker. And as anyone who knows kayakers at all know that one of the things that really hack us off is getting confused with rowers. So whenever I sort of head out from my driveway, my neighbour sees the boat on the car, he says, oh, going rowing again this morning, are you? But at least today I felt he was almost right. So it's good to be with you guys today. Um, looking forward to speaking with you. Um, but I'm also coming here with, uh, thank you for the introduction, but with quite a degree of humility because I'm speaking to you about coaching without knowing that much about rowing. But I guess that's the point of this talk, actually, to look at what coaching, what performance means beyond, the, beyond any one sport. Uh, can I start with a question of you? Would you put your hand up if before you became a coach or a, I know he's either, or a ologist or a practitioner of some sort, um, would you put your hand up if you were a competitor before? You, before? Pretty much everyone. Would you leave your hand up if you finished your competitive career completely satisfied with your own performances? <laughs> Thank you. So we went from about 100% of the room to maybe three or four of you. Great. Thank you. So there's something here for me that's interesting around coaching of why do we get into coaching in the first place and how much of that motivation is around, I, I want to get it right. I didn't quite get it right as an athlete, or I didn't know how, or I made mistakes, or I didn't have the guidance I wanted. And so that was some form of motivation to get into coaching. Would that be fair for some of you? Yeah? Certainly it was for me. Um, through the 80s, I was on the Australian slalom team, as uh, Adrian mentioned. It was a great time in my life. I look back on that period with real warmth. It was fantastic. Travelling around, uh, you know, competing in Europe, North America. It was fantastic. But I look back on it now and realise I didn't have a clue. I didn't really know much about the sport or about what performance was. And I think that was one of the things that drove my interest, my passion to want to learn more about that. Because of the nature of, of slalom canoeing, a little tiny bit of history, it was, out, it was in the Olympic program in 1972, then was out until 1992. It came back in in Barcelona. So, 92 was a big year for the world of slalom because we were back in the Olympic program. Uh, and it was really cool for me because I finished competing in about 1989, moved into coaching, and through some very unpredictable quirks of the nature of the sport, I found myself as the Olympic coach in Barcelona, which is ridiculous. I'd only been coaching for a couple of years, and yet I was coaching at the Olympic Games. So it was a very ridiculously fast trajectory. I was still young, immature as a coach. But we did okay. And Danielle on the right came away with the silver medal, so I had very early experience of, gosh, you know, this, this was amazing. Really cool. When I came to Britain the following year, or actually in 92 I came to Britain, I started working, I was asked to work with the British canoeing team, which as most of you will know, then and now are a very, very good team. Far better than the Australians were then. And I ended up coaching guys who I'd been competing with for the previous 10 years. People like Richard Fox, Melvin Jones, Sean Pearce. And this was a really tough experience for a young coach. I'd been coaching for two or three years. They knew me as a competitor. I'd, they'd come out to Australia, we'd train together, and they were all much better than I was. And suddenly, here I am, GB men's slalom coach. And I tell you what, I think I learnt more in the time I worked with them, probably than I have since as a coach, because it was incredibly, incredibly hard for me. And the reason was, there wasn't an awful lot I could offer them technically. It was very, they, they, they were better than I was technically. What was I going to do that was going to help them get better technically as competitors? as athletes, as slalomists. So it was a very tough situation to be in because up until then I'd been working with athletes who were either much younger than me or were kind of on a par and I was able to offer them something. So that experience really started to get me thinking about, so what, what is coaching? How does a coach provide support, provide input, provide benefit to athletes when you sort of take out the technical side? Let's just take that out, boom gone. 
I can hold a video camera and show them what they're doing, but couldn't really add much value to them beyond that. And that was a really interesting experience. And what I learned was that a coach can do an awful lot. And whilst I don't take full credit for it, they won the world championships, they finished first, uh, second and fourth individually, and they won teams. So at least I did no harm. That's, that's the best I would give myself. I did no harm. But what I learnt was, and what I've been learning with ever since, is that coaching is far more than the technical basis of the sport. Now, I don't want to downplay technique. I don't want to downplay that at all. And crikey, looking at all the stuff out there, it's a big aspect of your sport, isn't it? All those numbers. Numbers everywhere. Everywhere you look, you can get force this, ergo that, stroke rate that. Swamp with numbers. Graphs. It's beautiful. But I guess my question for you is, uh, what's producing those numbers? Is it another machine in there? Is it another bit of circuitry in there that you're charging to produce those numbers? Or are they human beings? Because certainly what I learnt working with these guys is that, that coaching is more than technique. It's about providing the right environment, the right support, the right challenge, making sure they know what they're doing, making sure they get to training on time, making sure the gates are set for them. There's an awful lot around coaching that's, that goes beyond technique. And so for me, the last 28 years now have really been a pursuit of this. A real question, a real fascination. So what is performance? What is performance? And what's the coach's role in that? I've been really fortunate because since that start, I've been able to work across the last seven Olympic and Paralympic cycles. I've worked with lots of people, both with the British skiing team, through the BOA, UK Sport, Paralympics GPs. So I've worked with lots of different performers, lots of different coaches. Uh, I also completed a PhD in 2013 where I tried to sort of bring together the learning I'd had over the years around this. So what I want to do for the rest of this talk is help to share some ideas about well, what, what does a coach do and what might a coach do beyond the really essential part of developing good technique. So I don't want to downplay that. It's absolutely necessary. But my argument is that having good technique and being able to row well is necessary but not sufficient if we're really talking about sustained and high level performance. So I want to help you explore what goes beyond that. Once you've got the technique right, what else is there? And so my first question is, so what is performance? It's a word that gets tossed around a lot, but what is it? Would, would, you, would I invite you to take 30 seconds and just compare notes with your neighbour what do you mean by the word performance? This, this is the terribly embarrassing time when I get you to talk to someone else, but would you give it a go just with the person next to you for 30 seconds? What do you mean by performance? Yeah? Thank you. Uh, great. Would anyone be brave enough to call out an answer or two? What, what did you come up with with this? What, what does performance mean? Come on. Be brave. Thank you. Consistent and dependable competitive results. Consistent and dependable competitive results. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so it's, not, it's a thing that leads to the results, but it's not the results itself. Okay, great. 
any, any others? Yeah. Finding your current limitations, where your boundaries are, of yeah. what you can achieve, whether it's mental, physical, and in a finite, like in a competitive environment. So okay, so finding your limits in a particular environment. Yeah, great. Yeah, great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what he said, yeah. <laughs> Some, one more down the back, yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you. Now, I, I haven't gone to the dictionary to get a definition, and I'm not presenting this as any kind of definitive thing, but when I was thinking about this, or as I've thought about this over the years, and so I was thinking about speaking with you folks today, I came up with something like this, that it's delivering your best, whatever it is, your best technique, your best stuff, um, when it counts. So I think came through with some of these things here. So for me, it's about, it's about producing something. It's not necessarily a result. Make, pick up with your point over there. The results are part of it, but results depend on what other people do as well. So I think to define one's performance purely based on what others do is, is pretty limited. Uh, so I'm focusing on what's your best. Uh, when it counts, I think this is the point, being able to switch it on. How many of you have come across the situation where you've got an athlete who is a complete beast in the gym or a complete beast in the ergo and they're producing numbers which you think are world class? But put them on the start line and, and they're, they're nowhere near it. Anyone come across that? Yeah? Yeah? So simply the capacity to be a good physical specimen or simply having the capacity to be able to engage that power with the right timing and technique in a boat isn't sufficient, is it? Because we've seen people who can do that in some conditions, but not when it counts. Yeah? So I think this timing aspect is really important when it counts, whether that's a selection race, a you know, particular regatta, a world championship, or Olympics, whatever. Performance is time-based. It happens at a particular point in time. So one of the most powerful ways I've come across to think about performance, and I really developed this when I did my PhD, I interviewed uh, about 15 world-class coaches across different sports to test this out with them, is the idea, well, let's think of performance as a process. I don't claim any originality for this, but it's useful. Let's think about performance as a process where there's a pre-event, there's some sort of preparation for it. It doesn't just come out of thin air. There's a time when I actually, or you, your crew actually have to do it. The gun goes. But then there's a time after that when we need to review and get ready for the rest. Yeah? Now this is basic stuff, isn't it? But my question for you and for the people you coach is, when does it actually start? So if the regatta's on Saturday, when does the performance for that regatta start? Okay, again, let me just have a, a little short chat. When does performance start for your rowers? If the regatta's on Saturday, in their head, in your head, when does the performance start for them? A little chat with your, with your colleagues, just for a minute. When does it start? No, no, take them. They're, they're books are there for everyone.
can we, can I just hear a couple of call outs? You know, so if Regatta's on Saturday, just get, throw out some dates, you know, some alternatives. When does performance start? The start of the season. The start of the season, okay. Other, thank you. Other, other thoughts? Tell me. Yeah. Ah, okay. So maybe there's a difference between athletes and coaches. Yeah. Any others? So maybe four years, six years even. Yeah. Okay. Wednesday, or well, Wednesday, Thursday. Oh, Wednesday Friday, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So this, 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 see, we've got different answers. It's context dependent, isn't it? It will depend. If you're an Olympic athlete, it's four years. If you're a, a school rower, then it might be the, you know, the day, the, the morning you wake up. It's going to depend. But one of the really important things, which I think is important as a coach, is to have thought this through and to talk to your athletes about this. Help them understand. And particularly if, with young athletes, help them understand that it isn't just about waking up that morning and I'm off to row. It may take more than that. It may take the preparation, will vary, but there is a cycle. And again, when does the performance end? Does it, does it end when the boat cross, crosses the line? Does it end when they've got out and warmed down? Does it end when? And again, that will vary. But that phase here where, is where the learning takes place. And if you're not enabling your athletes to learn and do this properly, to prepare for the next cycle, then I don't think you're really coaching. Yeah. So getting into the mindset of thinking, so what are, those, what are all the different cycles that will happen from week to week, from regatta to regatta, from year to year, from Olympic cycle? There's a nested series of these loops going on all the time. And as a coach, what I believe is important is to really work with this and help your athletes understand what do they need to do to navigate this cycle themselves in a meaningful way for them, depending on their level of maturity, their aspirations, all those things. How do they start to navigate this? Because one of the things that's really super important are the transitions. You mentioned here, you know, finish, finish training, get into race mode, yeah? That's the thing that has to happen, isn't it? We have to do this thing to go from normal life, whatever that looks like. Whether this is normal, I don't know, but I found it on the internet, this said normal life. <laughs> Into the mindset you need to be doing that. Psychologically, something really important needs to happen. If you imagine the mindset and the attitude and the way of being that it's like when you're there, and I would perhaps use words like focused, obsessed, determined, single-minded, selfish, yeah? Would that be fair descriptions? How well does that mindset work over here? Tough question. How many, I might, if I was brave, I'd say, how many of us are divorced in the room? And vice versa, the mindset that works over here loving, caring, collaborative, all those things. How well does that mindset work over here? It doesn't, does it? How your athletes, and in fact you, navigate from one to the other is really, really important. Because does it happen by accident? Does it just sort of automatically happen that they go from one to the other? No, at least not my experience. Because in my experience, people that aren't able to make the switch spend a big part of their life being dysfunctional. Because if I don't make the switch, if I don't know how to make that switch, I'm either going to be uh, too soft and caring when I need to be hard-nosed over here, or I'm going to be complete, you know, such and such over here when I need to be getting on with the rest of the human race. So this is a really important skill. How do you help your athlete manage that transition? How do you help them prepare to go from whatever their normal life is, into the competitive world, 
into the competition and then back out again. Again, think of that cycle. They're looping in and out of normal world into competition or training. You know, so this cycle happens not just on a, around a regattas, but maybe once or twice a day. <coughs> You've got to help your rowers, your athletes, learn how do I navigate this? How do I get it right? How do I hit the gym really hard and focused, but then when I go home or go to college or go to wherever else, I can kind of be a normal human being. And then when I get in the water, yeah? So it's an important skill to help understand that difference and help set up routines, help set up um, practical ways that help people tune into that, help people get little rituals, little habits that help them make that transition. One of the things I found really hard when I was um, in my first competitive career was going from the day's work to try and train. My mind was full of the stuff I'd been doing at work. It was really hard then to switch and concentrate on training. So I needed to develop a little routine. I, got, I drove to the training side, I sat in my car, and before I got out, I sat there for five minutes and just sat quietly and just relaxed and reflected on my day, wrote things down, wrote down my to-do list, put it to one side. Then I got out of the car and got changed and went training. Because without that, I'd be on the water and I'd still be thinking about what I was doing at work. Now, you can be creative in how you, you help your people do that. But if they're not doing that, if there's not something that's enabling this, then the chances are you're not getting your people in the right state of mind at the right time and you're not enabling them to go back to normality when they're not training. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the transition's really important. I believe that human beings are really, uh, you know, we're amazingly adaptable. We're amazingly responsive and creative in how we adapt to challenges. And if you think of the way that humanity's evolved over X tens of thousands of years, We've basically done it by adapting to the challenges the environment's thrown up to us. We're hyper good at that. We're really good at There's a challenge. How do I respond to that challenge? It's the same principle we go into the gym. We stress, stress the body, stress the muscles, they adapt. They get broken down, they come back stronger. Yeah, so we all, you know, we all know that that's how you get stronger in the gym, by progressively overloading, by creating greater challenges, and you get stronger. I think the same, we can take the same principle and take that out to performance as a whole and start to think, well, what are the other challenges? What are the demands that your rowers face throughout that performance cycle of preparing, of performing and reviewing? And a big chunk of that you know about, a big chunk of that, you've got all sorts of great tech out there that tells you what goes on between zero and 2,000 metres. So you've got great data there about the particular physiological demands, the timing demands, all of that, about what's going on in that 2,000 metres. But what else is going on? What are the demands they face in the, in the preparation stage? What are the demands they face in the post, in the review stage as well? What are the demands during competition that aren't going to be picked up by your, by your smart tech? So for me, and what I'm suggesting here is a way of thinking about how do you really hold a bigger picture of coaching and performance is to think about learning to perform is the same as helping your rowers, helping your athletes meet the demands they will face at each stage of that cycle, from preparing to performing to reviewing. Because if people can adapt, if I know what the challenges are, hey, I'm resilient, I'm, I'm, I'm smart, I'm committed, I will learn how to adapt if I know what the challenges are. I've never thought about them. I've never thought about the need to uh, think about the regatta two days before. I'll never do it. I've never thought about nutrition. I won't pay attention to nutrition. Yeah? So we've got to sort of tune, tune people into thinking about what are those demands. And I think that the better that you and your rowers have a shared understanding of what this is, the better you can coach them. So your job is to help them understand that and understand how they're going to meet that. So again, let me just pause and ask you to think about this, have a little discussion about it. So what are some of the demands that you're aware of that you help your rowers prepare for above and beyond the mechanics and the physiology of a good rowing stroke? Yeah? What else is there that they need to be good at, that they need to be able to do above and beyond being able to powerfully and consistently pull a blade through the water or pull the the boat past the blade, or however you describe it. Yeah? Minute with your colleagues. What else is out there? What are some of the challenges? Adrian, five minutes. Ooh, okay. 
What? Oh, right, okay, yeah. Thank you. Um, I realise I've misjudged time a little bit, so I'm going to move, move on a, a fraction faster than I'd intended. Um, so the sort of things to think about, I think there's the physical, which clearly, great, you've got fantastic kit there to look at that. Absolutely essential, but what else? Technical, yep, great tech out there. But also, well, how do you deliver that technique? How do you deliver the race plan? That's getting to the psychological there, isn't it? How do you help meet the psychological demands of, of racing, of staying focused, of sustaining motivation, uh, dealing with pressure, dealing with expectations, all that good stuff. Uh, and then I think the social aspect's really important well. How do you help people sustain the challenge of being an athlete? Because it's tough. I mean, this is why UK Sport have invented performance lifestyle advisors in the last 10 years. It's hard to do. There's an aspect there of being, still being a human being as well as being an athlete. So how do you help them do that? So one of the things which I think you could think about is coming up, doing a session with your athletes where you sit down and you get some flip chart out and you talk about this. Uh, and you talk about, okay, so when does performance start for us? When do we make this transition? When do we go from preparing to performing? And how do we manage that? When do we review it? How do we do that? What do we need to do at each stage? And if you then start to flip chart that up, then you can get of something on a sheet that says, okay, pre-event, this is what we need to be doing. Competition, this is what we need to be doing. And post-event, this is what we need to be doing. This is one for slalom canoeing. Um, you can take pictures of that. Yeah? But it gives you a shared framework for understanding what's the process, what's the journey we're going through, how does that work in training, how does it work in competition, on the basis that if human beings know what the challenges are, we're really good at adapting to them. But if I don't know what the challenges are, I'm a bit lost. I can put energy into all the wrong places. Yeah. Let me finish. Let me finish, because I think this is the really important part for me, and that's looking beyond sport. Because unless I've missed something really big, I'm not sure that the capacity to move a rowing shell down 2,000 metres really fast is a transferable life skill. Neither is paddling a, a kayak down 600 metres of white water, Maybe javelin's got something in it if we get into an apocalyptic age and you could go and spear your food, or maybe 100 metres is good if we've got to survive in the future. But most of the things we do in sport are not transferable in and of themselves, are they? So the learning that your athletes, that your rowers take from their time with you isn't going to be really valuable if it's limited to, I know how to row really well. So what else is going on? What will your rowers take into their future lives as a result of working with you? How will they be different human beings for the rest of their lives as a result of the time they spend, those long hours, the early mornings, the work in the gym, all that stuff, how is that going to help them be a better human being in the future? Will their time with you have helped them learn to retain some humility when they win? Will their time with you have helped them retain some resilience when they face defeat? Because I tell you what, they're transferable life skills. The capacity to, to remain humble in victory. By that I mean, when I've won, when I've been successful, 
can I still learn about myself and about that situation or do I simply head down to the pub and say that was great? Or do I simply cheer and say hooray and never think about it again? Because it seems to me we've got an awful lot to learn when we do things well, as long as we stay humble, as long as we retain humility, as long as you and your rowers retain humility in success. But likewise, resilience in defeat, because I don't know about you, but I suffered far more defeats than I did victories. Because, you know, for, most, for most athletes, that's the case, isn't it? It's rare exceptions, people win all the time. So how do you help your rowers stay resilient when you lose? Because I tell you what, you know this, you're a mature bunch. Life's full of setbacks, isn't it? There's plenty of setbacks in life. And the capacity to stay resilient, and again, to learn from that, to stay self-composed with that, to move on from that, is super, super important. Yeah. That's, I think, is where we're getting into with coaching here. What's going to make your rowers better, kinder, more thoughtful human beings? We know that working with you will make them tough, determined, strong, single-minded. Great. Yep. Terrific. But as we said before, that's only part of life. Another big part of life is actually being collaborative, being kind, looking out for people, being supportive. Are you going to pay attention to that as well? Because it seems to me that coaching is a really great privilege. It's a great responsibility. Because when coaching goes well, the relationship that you create with your athletes enables them to share their greatest hopes with you, their greatest dreams, their wildest aspirations. But if coaching's also going really well, they will also start to share their deepest fears with you. They'll start to share their vulnerabilities as a human being with you. And I tell you what, when someone, when another human being opens up to you in that way, something special is taking place. Something special <coughs> takes place. And as a coach, your responsibility to that human being is profound. Absolutely profound, particularly if you're working with people who are teenagers. If you're working with young people that stage of their lives from 12, 13 up to 20 is such, such an important stage of life. That sets the foundation for the next 80 years of them being on this planet. It really does. So if in their time with you in that period enables them to develop some technical mastery and some physical strength, and some capacity to really work hard and to produce the right numbers on an ergo, that's great. Because physical mastery is important. But if you limit your input to that, I think you're missing out on something really profound. And I'd really encourage you to do as much as you can to retain and develop your capacity to build mastery, technical mastery, physical mastery for your athletes. But please, please, please also think about them as human beings. Because those numbers on the little dials don't come from a little robot, they come from a person. And I really love you to bear that in mind as you go forward as coaches. Thank you very much. Is there a good time for a few questions, please? Fire away. Be here after as well, but yeah. awesome questions now. And, and if you're into reading the techie literature, take a photo of that. They're all journal articles that reference what we talk about. Any suggestions on working with bad apples? Bad apples? What's a bad apple? You have a, you have a team of people and you have one person who can't seem to get on it, even when you've really dedicated a lot of time. Uh, that's a good question. There's some really... <coughs> I was reading about this the other day, that there's a psychological principle that says bad is stronger than good. And that the, so the, 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 the effect of a bad influence far outweighs, you know, it's a stronger influence than lots of good. And so with teams, if you've got a choice, you might want to move that person out. I know you don't always have capacity to bring someone else in, but what the evidence is saying from a lot of research now is that, um, you know, removing a bad apple has a much bigger effect than strengthening the people who are doing well. Removing a bad apple, if, uh, sorry to, to go, go back to the same question, but that feels like giving up on somebody. 
Well, we could get into an interesting example of, again, of what a bad apple is and what you've done already and why, why are they a bad apple? That, for me, that the question, when someone's sort of not being a, when someone's being a bad apple, um, I, I, I'm, I'm a bit of an optimist. It doesn't always serve me well. But I kind of think that not many people get up every day thinking, right, today I'm going to be a real, you know, I'm not, we're not supposed to swear, but uh, not many people set out to be bad, do they? Most people, in my experience, set out to try and do their best. So someone's being a bad apple, what, what is it? What is it? What if their human needs aren't being met in this situation as a human? The need for control, need for relationship, uh, the need to get better at what they're doing. I'll always bring it back to those basic human needs because if someone is being a bad apple, how are their needs not being met in this situation? Or how do you need to help them get their needs met in this situation? You know, do they have a really high need for control and they don't have it in your, in your crew? Okay, now is that negotiable? Can that be changed? Is there a different way of them getting their need for control met somewhere else? That's where I'd go with that. Yeah. Um, how do you find the balance between being coaching and having that um, investment in yourself as a human that then also informs that's going to be so much more people. So how do you get that balance right between the investment in yourself and the ability to that, that's a really good question, and I think it's exceptionally hard to do. And I think if you look at the history of, if you look at the history of British sport over the 15 years, there's probably a lot of examples of that going wrong. And I think if you look at some of the situations where I think because of the pressure on results, I think it's really hard to forget that you're dealing with people, and then we get all sorts of bad things happening. Um, I think it's tough. I think the key thing for me would be to always try to remember that. The person opposite is a human being. And if I can hold that, they're not an object, they're not a resource, they're not a number on an ergo, they're a human being. And if I can hold that, despite whatever else is going on, it's likely that I'll be engaging with them constructively. But gee, it's hard. Yeah. Yeah, so I think, for, for me, teamwork is one of the fundamentals. Mm -hmm. So I didn't talk about those, but along with motivation and execution and decision-making, it's a fundamental. Um, it goes back to this thing about human needs. Uh, are each, is each person in that team able to get their needs met as a human being? Is there a way of talking about that? Is there a common purpose? Do we understand what we're trying to do together, as opposed to what the individual agendas might be? And are we able to create an environment where we can put that team agenda above my own? So I think the, the real challenge in team environments for, for athletes, it goes back to the, that transition slide. Um, you can think really, uh, one really simple way is asking yourself, okay, am I motivated about myself or about others? And a lot of individual athletes quite rightfully need to have their focus on themselves, what's right for me. In team sport, and in crews, they need another one of these agilities that people need to develop is the capacity to switch to the other. What's right for the other? It's a little bit like your question about, is there a human being here? But, but helping cultivate that ability to, to understand who's with me, who are they, what are their needs, what, what, what drives them as humans, and how do we collaborate? How, when appropriate, do I put my needs a little bit background to compromise and make it right for the whole team? And again, that's a skill that not everyone has, particularly youngsters. It needs to be cultivated and, 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 and made explicit that there'll be times when you get what you want, but there'll be times when you won't because there's four of us in this boat, or six of us <laughs> might be for you. Yeah. I think it's partially answered already. How do you deal with athletes who are genuinely conflicted? So they have family demands, they have work demands. Mm. Yeah. You want to be the work boss, you want to be the Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, look, it's another tough one, really, isn't it? Um, I think one of the key things there is developing some degree of, um, what's the word, probably acceptance. 
was said to someone before about the, 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 the tech problems. If there's a battle between reality and expectations, reality is always going to win. So for someone in that situation, they might have an aspiration that says, oh, I want to be an athlete at this level. But if you look at the reality of their world, that's not going to fit. And that might be really disheartening, it might be really upsetting, but the reality is that if they want to re retain those three poles in their life, that's going to create a limit on what they can achieve over here. Therefore, what's the negotiation? Can they reset aims that they can then fit within the constraints that they've got? Or can they change the constraints? But I think having tough, tough talks about what's realistic and where they want to prioritise is probably the key thing. And that the older an athlete gets, the tougher that becomes. Because those other things become more and more important. Family, work, everything else. It's harder to be 17 and single-minded or 20 and single-minded. Thank you very much.